Okay, let's begin. Good afternoon. Hello and welcome to the second hydraulics webinar, which is being organized by AIST's Lubrication and Hydraulics Technical Committee. My name is Charlie Bender, and I am staff engineer here at AIST. And the title of today's webinar is Machine Specific Steel Hydraulics. Before we launch the virtual training session, we at AIST would encourage several, you'll find them familiar elements that make a successful training conference whenever we get together. The first is our anti policy. And it really encourages us to adhere to the United States antitrust laws that are in place. Most importantly, don't try to set pricing or market share with competitors and really don't talk about your pricing strategy. It's really open market discussions that we encourage. Uh, we'll take steps to step this out of the conversation if it begins. Our next policy is an anti-harassment policy. And you'll see this if you've come to one of the AIST activities. Also, if you're planning to attend a training conference or AIS Tech uh, in person, there's a checkoff box in the registration process. We really are encouraging a harassment-free environment in all of our activities. I'll have just a little more information about the presentation format itself. The attendee audio for each of you who are attending has been disabled. Questions may be sent to the presenter and they should be submitted through the Zoom software using the question and answer feature. The host and the moderator will determine which questions are presented to the presenter. And if there are additional questions after the presentation, we'll have contact information for Brad at the end of the presentation. You should know that this session is being recorded and if you have technical difficulties in signing on to Zoom, please use the email trainingaist.org and we will help you through the email system uh, gain access to the presentation. There is one important reminder, photos and recording of the presentations is strictly prohibited. You will be given a link to access the presenter contact information. It'll also be at the end of the presentation and recordings will be available on the AIST website a few days after the webinar is finished. Our presenter today is Mr. Brad Jensen. He is a technology consultant for Alloy Technology Solutions, and he has been uh, the past founder and present patent holder of a company by the name of Intellischematic. He has more than 25 years experience in industrial training and troubleshooting in motion controls. He is a certified fluid power specialist by the International Fluid Power Society and has served for many years on the IFPS Board of Directors. His industrial troubleshooting experience comes primarily from the steel industry where he works today as a technology consultant for Alloy Technology Solutions. Brad Jensen is, has a Bachelor of Technology degree and automotive. At this point, Brad, I'd like to turn over the presentation to you if you're able to take the sharing of the screen. Okay, well, thank you, Charlie. Um, let me get the screens shared here. While we're doing that, I'll just say it's great to be with you today. A few weeks back, we started out with um, talking about Industry 4.0 and some of the applications out there uh, that help in troubleshooting hydraulic controls and among other things here. Um, looks like, Charlie, we're having a little difficulty on screen share. Brad, give it a try now. Okay, there we go. Thank you. You're welcome. So <clears throat> at our last uh, webinar, we talked about some of the applications out there that are used in 4.0 uh, to help troubleshooting among many, many, many other things that help us to collaborate and 
and um, improve the way we do things uh, in the steelmaking industry, particularly in the maintenance uh, and troubleshooting area and reliability area. So this next series beginning today will cover an introduction to machine specific hydraulic applications in the steel industry. And for these series of webinars, I, I will continue to use a 4.0 industry tool called iMachine that allows me to maneuver around and help you uh, understand uh, the hydraulic componentry and, and other things that we'll go over uh, in a machine specific way. Uh, today's discussion will be uh, around a down coiler, but in the future, um, we'll cover different deeper areas of discussion on other type uh, machines in, in steel mill manufacturing or steel manufacturing in the mills. Um, I will say that this is in context is geared towards people mechanics, technicians that are new to hydraulics in the steel industry and or operators. And to begin with, there are uh, six gaps that we try to close. And sometimes it takes mechanics, technicians several years to get skilled enough to where all these gaps are closed. Uh, the the iMachine tool and the reason why I'm using it, it helps close those gaps uh, and make you somewhat on par with those people that have had uh, experience uh, troubleshooting hydraulics. Today, I'll go over, to begin with, I'll go, I'll go over these, these six apps. Uh, I'll begin with, uh, or excuse me, these six gaps. The first one is missing or inaccurate hydraulic schematics. I call it a gap because that alone completely blocks us from being able to effectively and efficiently troubleshoot uh, hydraulic equipment. I realize that it's done without it in probably more cases than not, but I think that we need to begin to change that in the industry, particularly having the tools that we have today to keep our schematics updated and available for everyone. So the first gap is having a schematic to, to uh, troubleshoot or familiarize yourself with uh, the hydraulic system. Um, the next gap that comes along with the schematic um, is the need to understand the ISO symbology associated um, with the schematic. In other words, reading a schematic, uh, it takes a little bit of practice and time. Uh, the tool that we'll use here makes that go very, very easy and comfortable for people that are new uh, to the, the field of hydraulics. Schematics, symbology is like a different language. Uh, once we begin to understand the, the symbols, not necessarily um, what they look like, but how they function, we become very, very uh, familiar with uh, how the symbols work together when we go to read a schematic. In other words, uh, once we have the schematic in front of us, how do we now troubleshoot uh, using it, even if it is correct? Uh, number three, uh, when we read the schematic and learn how the components work together in a specific machine's operation, then we can begin to more effectively make assumptions on what component might be the problem. It eliminates this terrible habit in the industry of replacing parts till something begins to work. That's not safe, it's inefficient, and not to mention that most of those parts that 
we replace that doesn't solve the problem, they never get put back into spares. So it's a very, very costly uh, way of troubleshooting. The fourth um, gap is understanding hydraulic component application. In other words, um, it's one thing to understand how a pressure valve functions, but why is it in a circuit, a specific circuit in a specific place? So within these uh, hydraulic components classified as directional control, flow control, and pressure control, they have often very different applications and where they are in the circuit um, gives us understanding where they are in the circuit helps us understand in in the, the the troubleshooting realm of things why things might not be functioning the way we think they should the fifth the ability to identify a specific component location from the schematic even when understanding the ISO symbol. This is a very, very difficult uh, gap to overcome. Even if you read circuits well, you understand symbology well, um, if you are new to a machine, you could be looking at a schematic identifying what might be the problem or, or maybe identifying the different events, learning how the machine is functioning, uh, but not really able to identify where the valves are located or what valves. We could have four or five uh, logic valves uh, stamped around a manifold, for example, and determining which one is, is which on the schematic might might be uh, a very difficult, if not impossible, um, thing to identify. So again, these tools that we now have uh, available today, which are relatively inexpensive, um, take care of that gap, as you will see here in a bit. And then the last gap that we won't go into today much, it's down the road a bit in some of our uh, series that we'll be doing. It's how do we simplify the electrical controls and map to uh, them and combine the hydraulic and the controls together in effective troubleshooting. So these six um, gaps, as I call them, keep them in mind today as we go through um, some of the circuits here in this down coiler. Now, when we begin at square one with, with hydraulics, if you're new to, to hydraulics, um, whether you're a, a technician, a, a, a maintenance uh, mechanic or technician or an operator, look at it in terms of this diagram right here and it'll it'll help simplify for you in this diagram here you notice that we have on the left a hydraulic uh, hpu or the power unit itself it's the reservoir the pump motor assembly fluid conditioning and other associated components and here in a minute we'll we'll begin to step into this. But always in your mind, understand that this is how the design, this is how they are laid out in the industry. Um, you, you have to have an HPU. Uh, the heart of that is the fluid. It could be petroleum based, it could be uh, water glycol. Those uh, differences in fluids give us differences in components and other things that, that we can discuss later but at the heart of it is the, the, the fluid, the reservoir, the pumps, and all the conditioning uh, componentry that keeps the fluid in top-notch condition 
uh, as it is sent downstream to the various valve stands and to the actuators. So from the hydraulic power unit, we send fluid down to various valve stands. Now those valve stands could be one, two, seven or eight. That's entirely depending upon the, the machine. If it's, a, if it's a, uh, a caster, you could have quite a few more than just three valve stands. The valve stands are where the hydraulic control componentry sits that controls the actuator downstream that is going to control the work. So at the end of the day, all we're really trying to do is get something to raise, lower, turn, rotate. Uh, and that's all done at the very end with the device that we call an actuator, which we can break down into a cylinder, in, out, up, down, a motor that gives us complete rotation, continuous rotation, uh, one direction or both directions or a rotary actuator that can, gives us various amounts of degrees of rotation. And those are really um, all, there are, all there are when it comes to, to actuators. Now, you might be asking, some of you may have an electrical background, you might be saying, well, why don't we do that all electrically? Well, there's a little thing called power density and hydraulics solves that problem. It's very, relatively speaking, small componentry can do a lot of work. Uh, um, the, the, uh, the other uh, advantage to the fluid controls is how easy it is to, to take energy from the, the input here at the high, uh, off our electric motors, oops, I just, Lost you there for a minute. And um, send that all the way downstream through a valve stand, through some controls out to the cylinder uh, without the mechanical direct drives or whatever that might otherwise be required. So there's a lot of advantages to fluid power. And although it creates problems sometimes with leaks and other things, it's, it's ubiquitous in the steel industry and always will be. Um, the interesting thing about the valve stands, they consist of a manifold with porting that takes the main pressure into the valve stand. It returns tank pressure back to the reservoir. And it consists of all of these control valves that govern the speed of the cylinders, uh, the amount of force, and other things relative to the work requirement downstream at the actuator. But the good news is there are only three basic types of valves. And you only have to remember three. Now, there are quite a few variations within those groups, but you can be sure that as you're looking at a valve stand and all these valves land across it and stacked, they're going to be directional control, flow control, or pressure control. No more than that. So I like to break it down into these three pieces, the HPU, the valve stand with its controls, and the actuators. Okay, now we're going to take, keep in mind this, this block diagram here. We're now going to take another step and, and go over to an actual schematic uh, that you'll see um, on a down pointer. So here we go. This is the iMachine layout of the hydraulics on a down coiler. Now this layout also includes automatic gauge control and the valve stands and the HPU that go with that, but we're not going to to go into that today, we're going to just stay with the down coiler here. You'll notice that at the top over here, I have the, in the indexing, I have the HPU, 
And here's one side view of what it, it looks like. Uh, now I show valve stand one that has, by the way, two manifolds on it, but it's still valve, it's still considered a valve stand independent of, of the others. Valve stand two and the third valve stand. So this particular down coiler has uh, its, its, its uh, power unit with all the, the componentry that goes with that and it has three valve stands and within those valve stands we have various stacks of, of components that lead down to their respective act, uh, actuators. So let's go back and start with the HPU. I'm going to click here and take me to another view. And this view here shows what I've done here is designated all of the major elements on a pump motor assembly that's leading into the main pressure header that's going down to the valve stand. And you can see here that I've got the, the this is a number five pump. There's actually five uh, pump motor groups on this. We're just looking at one corner of the, of the HPU here. We'll talk about the pressure compensator in a little bit, but that lies behind here. We have the inlet into the pump and we have the main pressure outlet. We have a case drain and we have a bearing flush, which tells me that this is water glycol because I'm very familiar with this pump. It's Rexroth A4 VSO. Uh, and when you use water glycol, you've got to flush the front bearing or it will not last as long as you would like. We have a high pressure filter and we have various two flow meters, one here and one here that are measuring the flow uh, this one coming to the bearing flush and this one going back to the reservoir because we've got to drain the case off the pump and we'll explain that here in a bit. Now I click over here on this other side of the, of the uh, HPU. This is what we call fluid conditioning. So on every hydraulic power unit you will find on the same skid because we're using the same reservoir because we're conditioning the fluid in that reservoir and by conditioning it we're maintaining the proper filtration uh, better termed the proper amount of contaminant that is allowed in the fluid depending on the type of uh, circuits we're running if we're running high-speed servo valves we're we're trying to maintain a class four cleanliness level. And we're also maintaining heat because one thing that's happening in a hydraulic system is you are immediately generating heat and we, we control that. We like to keep um, the temperature somewhere between 110, 120, um, never to exceed 140 if possible. We get up to 160 and we've, we've created real issues. We've, we've oxidized, began to oxidize the fluid and uh, it's non-reclaimable at that point. But these components uh, that we'll go over here in a minute uh, help that happen. They help us keep the fluid uh, conditioned. Now, I'm going to uh, go back and show something here in the 4.0 uh, iMachine tool. These break these, the, the different elements of the system down by, by valve stands. And within the breakdown, at the bottom here, I further break it down into events. So 
we've got two primary events on this down coiler relative to the HPU. We've got pumps running, our main pumps, four with one backup, and then we've got a recirculation system here with the recirculation on. So I'm going to have uh, hydraulic circuits that are indicating that. So now we're going to take a big jump over to the actual schematic from what I've just shown you. And I'll zoom in here a bit. And with this tool, I can maneuver around. I'll show you a few things right off here. I have a legend that is very, very important uh, for you to understand. This is this is an ISO international standard colorization of the, the condition of the fluid or the dynamics of the fluid associated with what color it should be if I'm coloring a specific circuit or related event. Red is pressure. Red is always pressure. Blue is always exhaust, return flow tank flow. A dashed blue means that it's low pressure tank fluid, but it's coming out of a case drain or out of a, uh, the, the pump case and going back to the reservoir. Green, a solid green is uh, su uh, suction or intake flow. A dashed green is pilot drain or vent flow. In other words, some of these valves downstream are, are pilot operated, meaning elect, an electrical solenoid valve is, is piloting fluid that powers the valve open, the, the, the pilot valve open or close. And it could have either an internal or an external drain. And uh, a dash green is that pilot vein or vent flow. Yellow is always metered flow. Metered means that we're reducing the amount of flow. Uh, and by reducing the amount of flow, we're simply slowing something down. A dash yellow is restricted meter pilot flow. Orange is pilot supply or reduced pressure, either or. And a dashed orange is the pilot signal. In other words, these valves that downstream that you'll see here in a bit might be uh, pilot actuated because of the amount of flow going through them. A, a small solenoid valve can't, the spool can't shift. There's too much flow. So we we pilot them open. Um, and when that occurs, uh, we use the orange to indicate that it's externally piloted. And very often, we have a pump even on the, in, in our system here that's nothing more than that's controlling pilot flow. Or we pull it off our main, our main pumps. And then purple indicates intensified pressure. So there are times in these circuits where we can intensify the pressure or take it above what the pump is compensator is set at or what the relief valve is set at. And uh, we use purple to indicate that it is intensified. So that's a very, very important um, thing to, to understand because it's not just in this particular uh, application that's using, that we're using to read and, and understand the schematics. It's, it's universal to many manufacturers. I, Caterpillar has been using this for eons and Komatsu and, and other manufacturers of mobile equipment. But it's all the same, it's universal and it's international. So now let's go back again to our I'll zoom out so we can see the whole circuit here. Uh, 
I have identified, you notice down here it says the HPU is running. And over here I have the other pumps that are on the back side of the, the hydraulic power unit. And once they are combining with this main header up here, our main pressure line, they're running down to these various valve stands. And each valve stand has its circuits on it. So the minute that those pumps are fired up, um, flow is going all the way down to the P line of all these valve stands ready for those valves to be energized to make work happen. But for now I'm going back up to my pump that I've designated or I, I've colored running, pumps running. And by the way, uh, they would all be this same configuration, except perhaps the one that was on standby. You'll notice here that I've got the reservoir down here and the reservoir is where the pump is drawing its fluid from. So this is the inlet to the pump. And by the way, on the reservoir, I won't spend a lot of time here, but in the symbology, um, for example, I'll show you a, um, an indicator. When I roll over this in the top, left side up here in this screen, you'll see a, a picture of actually where it is. And if I click on this, it will show me the image of it, an arrow showing where it is, and then it gives a description of that component. Often a part number, a manufacturer, and et cetera here. There's usually additional, um, documentation that goes along with that. So let me go back. That was an indicator. This down here is a heater. I click on that. It's located right here behind this panel. And it is there to make sure that the temperature in that reservoir is maintained at a specific uh, requirement. Um, let me play for you. I've got an animation under this additional information. I can uh, click on this. Hydraulic systems often use tank heaters to ensure a constant fluid temperature. The fluid temperature control is critical to ensure maximum life and operational efficiency from hydraulic components. The viscosity of the fluid is affected by temperature change. A low viscosity fluid can create problems with component operation. In the example shown here, the tank heater can incorporate a thermostatic control. The heater is installed in the reservoir below the fluid level and close to the pump inlet. A low density element prevents the fluid from burning. Usually 10 watts per square inch is recommended. Okay, let's jump out and go back to our power unit, but I can, um, and, and again, if you've kept track of those, those six gaps, I've already uh, eliminated two or three of them right off. Um, also, over here on the left, in this particular event, which is called the HPU pump running, that is an event in the system. Um, and what we do once we have the system, whether you do it through an application or whether you do it just from a, a hard schematic that you're holding in your hand, you are going to identify different events that are taking place on the hydraulic system in the, in the down coiler. And on the HPU, the, the single most important event that you'll want to understand what's happening 
in is pumps on. So when that event begins to take place, the PLC says, fire up, we're going to work. You have on the left here a sequence of exactly what's occurring. Now, believe me, once you take all this information, because remember, we're in, we're, we live in an industry 4.0. It's crazy not to get up to speed on it. Once you take all this data information and, and build it in, however you, you do that, whoever's application you're using, or even if it's homespun uh, on your own, it's there for the next guy. It's there for everybody. So here is just a list of sequential steps into this event that we call pumps running. I'll read number two, electric motor D1 starts operating. Hydraulic fluid flows from the inlet line through the ball valve H1 right here. into the inlet of pressure compensated pump B1, which is right here, which delivers flow from its outlet port. And then it, it goes on to explain what's, what's happening and I'll walk, I'll walk through that with you. But this is the textual version, I call it, of of every event on this, uh, every hydraulic event on this down coiler. So we go through uh, the ball valve, or in this case, a butterfly valve, into the inlet of the pump. Um, on the reservoir, again, we have uh, fluid temperature switches, we have uh, temperature transducers, um, the heater that I went through, uh, breathers, return line filters, and etc. And of course, over here is our conditioning uh, symbols, components. You'll notice a hydraulic pump is indicated by a circle with a dart. That means that it is pushing or sending energy out. And the circle with an M in it is an electric motor. And we've got a little mechanical uh, symbology there that shows that it's, it's coupled. It's the same on our primary uh, pump motor group right here. As we leave, let me zoom in here. Again, these are the fluid conditioning pumps. They're going through check valves. You notice the arrow, if you will, or the ball laying in the arrow shows that it's blocked back to the outlet of the pump, but it's free flow going this way, the fluid. So, if this pump over here was shut down, fluid couldn't backfeed into the, the outlet of the pump and run it in, in reverse. And a ball valve is shown symbology with this symbol here. And this, of course, is a, is a gauge. And over here, we have a three-way ball valve because we're deciding as this pump is sending fluid in, in, in terms of keeping circulating and keeping it, the, the reservoir uh, clean, the fluid in the reservoir clean, I'm going through one of two filter uh, housings. I can keep one offline, change the element out while the other one is running without shutting it down. Again, we have check valves. Check valves are just one direction, directional valves. So I have cleaned the fluid 
or filtered it. I clean it by filtering it continuously. And over here, I have the opposite of a heater. I have a heat exchanger, which is taking the heat and removing it. So the arrows, instead of pointing in, as shown down here, they're pointing out. So I'm taking the, the warmer fluid on the heat exchanger and removing it uh, back out <clears throat> through this cool water circulation here. So if I, you can see on the, on the picture up the left, this is what I'm actually referring to here. That could have been a tube and shell. This is a plate heat exchanger, but the symbol is the same. The symbol indicates what it does, not what it looks like. Always remember that. If I want the plate to. heat exchanger is a specialized design well suited to transferring heat between medium and low pressure fluids. This type of heat exchanger is used extensively throughout the industry, particularly in applications that require a large amount of fluid heat to be removed in a relatively short period of time. So let me back up and move quickly on here back to our primary pump. And I want to talk for just a minute about this pump. It's an axial piston pump. It's not a gear pump. It's very different than a gear pump. And this particular pump produces around 66 gallons per minute at 1200 RPM. It has a pressure compensated device on it, which allows the fluid that now with this motor energized fluid has gone through the filter up into our, my pressure header downstream to, to all these valve stands. And when it gets to a particular valve stand, I'll just click on one down here. It comes in the P port, main pressure. It goes up through this particular valve here, which I haven't explained yet what that is, but it goes through that valve right up and you'll see that it's blocked there. And it's blocked on all of them. So the, so the minute that uh, hydraulic power unit is turned on in this particular system, fluid is sent down all the way down to every valve stand. And then what happens? Well, it's got to go somewhere or the pump has to destroke and put itself in standby. Because at this point, potentially maybe no work has been asked for downstream off one of those uh, circuits. So what does the pump do? The compensator on the pump, because it's, it's an actual piston pump, the swash plate goes back to top dead center, not 100%, but it's enough to maintain the compensator. And the pump sits at zero output flow but at compensator setting, which is 2000 PSI. So let me show you what I mean on this. A variable displacement pressure compensated pump is designed to respond to the pressure changes occurring in a hydraulic system. Now, this is the swash plate right here. Advantages of a pressure comp. This is the swash plate right here. These pistons and their shoes are riding on this as they go around, they go around and around. This spool up here 
the spring has that swash plate at an angle. As long as that is at an angle, when this shaft is rotating, these pistons are going in and out. They're drawing fluid in on the suction side. When they start back down the swash plate, they're pushing it out. And that's how we produce flow. When the pump goes into standby, this swash plate has to go perpendicular to the shaft. Compensated circuit are energy conservation, better controllability, and concurrent actuation of several circuit functions. Some of these advantages are offset by higher component costs. A variable displacement pressure compensated pump is most often used in a closed center system. This example uses a pressure compensated piston pump. Understanding the functionality of a piston pump is helpful. So if a review is necessary, return to the piston pump section. Okay, what I'm going to do because of the sake of time here, we're going to continue downstream. We're going to go to valve stand number two, I believe. And I'm going to, I'm going to take you to the outboard bearing clamp cylinder circuit. So I'm going to click here. Now I have the valve stand. It's being fed from the hydraulic power unit. The ball valves that are opening and closing. Um, from the cylinders. I've got the, the, the stacks here. This is the one I'm going to zero in on. Call the outboard bearing. I'm going to click on the event. Notice over here. Again, I have a written out step by step of what's happening on that event. It's for my own reference. Eight months from now, suddenly I've got a problem here. And I want to be able to very quickly understand what that stack is doing, why it's there, and what it's feeding, and any other information that I need. So coming off our main uh, pressure header into the valve manifold, I'm going, this, this spool has, uh, or this coil has been energized, shown my, my little symbol here. And the valve has shifted. You'll notice over here that this particular valve has a drain off from it, as we had talked about before. Let me show you how this valve works. This is called a directional control valve. And you'll notice that there's three boxes. One. One, two, three. In the center position, it's blocked. However, the A and B are open to T. We'll talk about that in a second. But right now, this coil has been energized. This is where that valve sits. That's nice to know, right? That's a huge gap. This directional control valve controls the extension retraction of the outboard bearing clamp cylinder. That's what it's doing there. That's what it's controlling. But I want to show you something that that's, has uh, a lot of relevance here. A direct acting directional control valve is either manual or solenoid actuated. Direct acting indicates that some method of force is applied directly to the spool causing the spool to shift. In this illustration, energizing the solenoid or coil creates an electromagnetic force, which pulls the armature into the magnetic field. As this occurs, the connected push pin moves the spool in the same direction while compressing the return spring. As the spool valve shifts, port P opens to port A, and port B opens to port T or tank, allowing the cylinder to extend. When the coil is de-energized, 
the return spring moves the spool back to its center position. View the entire animation uninterrupted. Now I'm going to stop it right there. In hydraulics, you can be certain of one thing. If it slides, it leaks. So if this was a, a, a what we call a fully closed center uh, valve, meaning that in that center position, P, A, B, T, they were all blocked, you would get, with that hydraulic, uh, at the HPU, those pumps running at 2,000 PSI, you would get leakage across this spool right here. Not a lot, but some. And what that would do, because of differential areas in cylinders down here, that cylinder would begin to slowly creep out on you. The only way we can prevent that and get rid of that, that's why you'll see in mill hydraulics, you will see most every directional control valve spool configuration is, is I call it a J spool. Uh, you can see over here, 4WH10J. That's just the Rexroth nomenclature for uh, the, the, the P is blocked, but A and B go back to tank. Um, let me go back here. So the only way I get to keep this from drifting out, I put a J spool in here and allow it that trap fluid to bleed to, to bleed the tank. But I have to put a PO check in here. It's a sandwich check valve. It fits right under here. And that in neutral will hold this cylinder in its current position. It won't allow any of the fluid to move from the cap end over to the piston end, or excuse me, from the, from the piston, from the rod end over to the piston end and allow that cylinder to drift out. The other components that I have stacked here, I've got a pressure reducing valve. You can always tell a pressure reducing valve by the nose that hangs out. It's a pressure valve, but what it does is it actually reduces something below compensator setting on the pump. We don't want 2200 PSI ever based on what it's pushing against on this uh, cylinder up here. So I have to put a reducing valve on the A side. And then I want to slow it down. Here's this yellow flow here. Um, and here's a flow control valve, which is, here's a check that shows reverse flow around it. And by the way, I'm coming up the wrong, wrong side here. I'm free flowing around it here. I'm coming back here. So I'm metering out not in for various reasons. That's important to know too. But I'm checked here. This orifice shows that flow meters across. Anytime you see an arrow diagonally through a symbol, it means that it's adjustable. So this adjustable flow control valve is now metering the flow out. So it turns from yellow, which is metered, back to blue, this pilot, orange pilot line over here has opened this check valve so it goes on through the check valve, around the reducing valve, and back to the reservoir. I think we're out of time. Um, I, I need to stop now to see if there's any questions. Uh, I will state that this series uh, of of what we're doing here, we'll continue on a regular basis through the year and maybe beyond, but I will be using different equipment that you're familiar with 
um, as we do this. So, Charlie, I'm going to turn this back over to you to see if there are any questions or, or whatever. If there's not, I have one other thing I could share with everybody. I think you're on mute. I thank you. I didn't hear that, Charlie. Brad, let me see if I pull up questions. We've actually had five questions, Brad. I put them in order so that we could kind of flow through these and keep everybody within the 60 minute presentation. But our first okay. question came from Josh, and he's asking. What is the setting of the pump pressure switch in the filter assembly in the pump drain line? What is the, what is the setting of the pressure switch in the filter assembly in the pump drain line? I'm really glad that you brought that up because I'm gonna go back to that. I won't spend a lot of time on it. And I know why you're asking, and I didn't design this system. But what we always want to be careful of. Do you want to share your screen quickly, Brad? Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, Josh is referring to this right here. What you have to be very careful of is restricting any flow out of the case drain of the pump. In fact, for, for years, a lot of manufacturers wouldn't warrant their pump if you used a flow meter. And, and the purpose of the flow meter there, it, well, the purpose of the filter is to filter the fluid coming out of the case but I don't like to do that because you keep the fluid clean other ways and you go through the flow meter right back to the tank, not through the filter. Because if you don't have a PSID, 15 PSI differential pressure drop, and I think that is answering your question across there, you could build back pressure, which would lift the shoe off the swash plate. And when that occurs, that pump is going to come apart. So you, you've got to be very, very careful about case pressure on an actual piston pump. But I believe that is 15 PSID. Okay. Brad, I think if we go through the other questions quickly, we may or may not have time to answer all of them. But we'll I, I give would, contact information so that we can go through the questions and have everybody after the 60 minute presentation wait for the answers if they have them. Okay. The next question comes from Leonardo. In Colombia, they're encountering a lot of heat. Do you have experience with the use of thermal imaging as a diagnostic tool for hydraulic systems. And then let me show you the other three questions and we'll take each one as you can. Coxon definitely understands that your voice has a lot of experience and he's asking how long did it take to prepare the intelligent schematic for something larger like a tin plating line or a tandem line with lots of oil flow and hydraulics. It could conceivably take a long time to make the hydraulic schematic intelligent. Then he has a second question. Does the software need a huge domain expert, like someone who knows every equipment very well? That's a question about converting uh, other parts of the mill. We have also a question from Lewis. The servo hydraulic in the hydraulic cylinder. What about making that into a spark component? And will there be more seminars on hydraulic servo control? And then the last question is, how can we get more information specifically about the software? So if folks are able to stay longer, we'll cover these questions. I'd also like everybody to receive Brad's contact information in case you can't stay longer than an hour. 
And we certainly do appreciate, Brad, the presentation and the return to these questions if there's time. Okay, the first question, or the, I'll, I'll start with the last question and work back. Um, well, Leonardo asks about the, um, the, um, the thermal transfer imaging. Yes, and what I like to do is just use a, a, a laser uh, heat gun, I call it, but thermal, trans, or thermal Im imaging works very, very well. Uh, to to isolate, not necessarily to isolate, but see where the heat uh, is is migrating to. Um, but yes, there's a lot of tools out there now, and heat is the number one troubleshooting uh, resource to fixing problems. Okay, the next question. It takes about thirty days to input the data into the iMachine or the IntelliSchematic, it's, it's, it's with the tools that are available today, that importation or importing that in, that integration of it is, is really not that uh, hard at all. Uh, there are several, uh, many, I call them subject matter experts. I know work at Alloy where I do consulting that uh, are retired and they uh, love to import data and they're, they're fluid power experts. So I think that answers that question. And um, what was the other, the, the last one, Charlie? Oh, does the software need a huge domain expert, someone who knows every, oh, I think I answered that. Yeah, we have steel mill or fluid power specialists retired in their industry and business that, that uh, work with us in importing the, the data. And last, uh, Lewis, we will definitely be going into depth on high-speed servo valves, fluid conditioning, uh, controls, troubleshooting, the logics that are driving this, the, the valving and et cetera. But this will be down the road as we work along in these seminars. And please send me information. I'm more than happy to uh, answer emails back on any questions they have. Very good, Brad. Thank you again for your presentation this afternoon. We want to remind people that the technical committee is organizing additional webinar events, as you know. Just continue to watch the AIST calendar feature on the AIST website. The fall activities also include a virtual meeting, much like this set of tools, to be able to enjoy a committee meeting in case we can't get together in person. There are additional webinars taking place. Again, you can see them either through the webinar tab on the AIST website or on the calendar feature. And each of these that have been recorded are available for use later when you go back through the AIST website. So feel comfortable going back and reviewing this particular presentation or any of the others that uh, you show some interest in. Brad, I certainly want to appreciate uh, this presentation. You've had nearly 60 people that have stayed through the presentation, asked some excellent questions. And uh, it seems as though there may be a few more questions. Uh, I will get them to you after the presentation. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you everyone much. for attending. And Prepare to come to another webinar when it's convened in your schedule. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.